Hello, I'm Steve Wolf, president of and co-founder of the Beyond Earth Institute. Welcome. Today, we have an amazing program on future space infrastructure headed up by a great uh, keynote by Kathy Leaders, NASA Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations. But before we get into the program, there's just a couple of things that I want to share with you and discuss with you about Beyond Earth and what's going on in the space community. You know, yesterday, Christian Davenport had an article in the Washington Post, some of you may have seen this, that of all the legacy programs of the Trump administration that President Joe Biden is working to dismantle, there's one area that he's chosen to embrace. And that's the space program, NASA. Certainly great for Artemis and certainly great for Kathy leaders. This is a good this is good news for the human space flight and exploration. But it and it also gets us another step closer to beyond Earth's vision of creating communities beyond Earth. Another sign that the new administration is embracing advanced space research is DARPA's announcement of the NOMAD program, an effort that aims to develop new materials, manufacturing, and design technologies to enable future structures to be built on orbit and on the surface of the moon. How cool is that? They're looking to think outside the box. How could we learn to live off the land? Uh, and, uh, and, and possibly even stimulate the coming of the space industrialization. And this is another step that will get us closer to communities beyond Earth. With, the Artemis, uh, with Artemis and Nomad, it's all about putting uh, in place the infrastructure that is going to enable sustained human presence in space. The Beyond Earth Institute could not be more supportive of these activities. I mean, today we are looking forward to SpaceX launching SN10, another Starship experimental launch. And we will continue to promote policies that enable governments and private actors to go even further. The ongoing policy research, for example, at the Beyond Earth Institute include uh, property rights in space, governance, norms and behavior, among populated space facilities, related arbitration and dispute resolution, uh, identification of technology gaps, uh, among other kinds of research. But I wanna be clear um, on, the, on the position that the Beyond Earth is taking. Creating communities beyond Earth is the end game for all human activities in space. It's going to be hard, and many people are going to, are still saying it's impossible. But let's make no mistake. We go back to the moon and on to Mars with people to learn to live off the land, to learn to manufacture the stuff that we need while we're up there from the resources that are in space. We do that for no other reason than to eventually enable the expansion of human civilization beyond this planet. I wanna thank all of those who have already supported our mission. We will, we will post a link in the chat field today where you can show your support by making a donation today, and I certainly hope that you will. So now let's get into our program. So first I wanna recognize the sponsor of this event, the Sierra Nevada Corporation. SNC is not a household name, but everybody in the space industry knows who they are. SNC has supported NASA for, uh, on hundreds of successful missions, most recently the amazing landing of NASA's Perseverance rover on the Mars surface. Uh, and that, by the way, is the 14th time that SNC went with NASA to Mars. SNC contributed to the, contributed the descent brake mechanism that landed, uh, that landed the rover safely. It also provided the component parts for the Ing Ingenuity helicopter. Certainly that's one of the coolest parts of that, of that mission. Of course, SNC is best known for the Dream, Ch Dream Chaser space plane. Dream Chaser will be servicing the International Space Station for NASA uh, next year. Looking forward to that. It will land on a runway much like the shuttle did, so that would be something really cool to see. It, uh, Dream Chaser certainly will be an important moment in American 
space history and its future. And now I'd like to ask Brett on our team to, uh, to show a video that SNC has prepared for us today. Brett? Very cool, very cool. Thank you for that, SNC, and thank you for your sponsorship. It's now my pleasure to in introduce our keynote, uh, Kathy Leaders. After after she speaks, Ms. Leaders will, will join a panel discussion moderated by Beyond Earth co-founder Tom Morata. So Kathy Leaders is NASA's Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations. She was named to this position last year, and prior to that, Ms. Leaders was the, has directed NASA's efforts to send astronauts into space on private spacecraft, which culminated in the successful launch of Demo-2 aboard SpaceX's Crew Dragon from the Kennedy Space Center last May. Uh, her long tenure at NASA's, uh, with NASA's Human Spaceflight Program began way back in 1992 uh, with the White Sands Test Facility. I'm sure she was just like a, a a young intern, no, uh, in, in, in New Mexico, where she worked uh, for the space shuttle program. So, Kathy, we're very glad that you could join us uh, and uh, and and welcome you. And you have the floor. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me here. And uh, that was a really really exciting video, Janet. So, um, looking forward to we're looking forward to the crew for to the cargo missions that will be being delivered on that uh, the dream chaser. But let me get into my slides because um, the introduction and the, the discussion you're having at the very beginning, uh, Steve was like really complements the message that I have going forward. So maybe we can start at the beginning. <laughs> uh, because we also, we have, you know, this, the vision of going long-term and sustainably um, into for our space exploration. And people talk a lot about why do you have these different platforms? And so what we found out is, is that we need a low earth platform, a lunar platform and a Mars platform. And each of those are getting us ready for that next step, right? Um, I love hearing the description about what, some of the, the goals that we have to have to be able to be able to live on each of these platforms. And I kind of view each of these surfaces as, you know, our, our, our own, along with the earth, our own orbiting platform that we have. And, and when you first have to go and work, when we had to learn how to live and work off of the ISS, we had to learn to live and work off of that platform. And us getting ready to, to figure out then now, how do we, live and work on the lunar surface and around the and around the moon, that's gonna get us ready for that big next step of being able to live and work on Mars. Now, all of these steps are accomplished with us first, and we always talk about this, that we do bots first and boots next, right? Because you have to learn about these areas to then understand what's the right way for us to put people there and be able to work and live there sustainably. Next phase, next, yeah, thank you. So, you know, people, people ask, why do we stay in low earth orbit? And what we've learned after 20 years in station and what we're gonna learn after, and I don't know how, many, how long we'll be on the, 
around the lunar surface and on the lunar surface, but we we know that we've got to learn and solve some big problems and 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 some big problems were were mentioned before that will enable us to make this next step. And so we've got to solve hardware problems and and the space stations allowed us to be able to deal and test closed loop ecosystems, for example, begin to figure out how do we how do we grow plants for long term missions? Um, what what's the right how do we set up and, and establish an economic benefit for the platforms that we have? Um, how do we make sure we got common data transfer? And then, and then how do we, what are the right ways for us to stimulate the economy here on earth and around that platform to be able to then make that a sustainable presence in that area? We, the space, the space station's been an incredible test bed for us to be able to, to push the boundaries on all these things and get us ready to then now apply those lessons to the moon. Next slide. So what are the key components of this, of the, this first the LEO economy and then maybe how would that then apply for us to be able to go move to the moon and even look at then what first steps we need to be able to have for a sustainable Mars um, presence. So, you know, we know that we've had to be able to enable commercial and marketing activities. We've had to partner with industry. We've had to begin to look at how do we fly private astronaut missions? How do we enable commercial destinations? You saw the Sierra Nevada vision there. Um, how do we work with different companies to hopefully one day be able to use a commercial LEO destination? How do we make sure we got the industrial base and are continuing to evolve the industrial base to be able to accomplish these hard missions? And then how do we establish what our longer term needs are and the things that we're going to need to have happen for us to make that next step? Next slide. So we are using, like I mentioned, but I'm going to give you some very discrete areas where we are using space station as a test bed, and we'll need to continue to use our lunar orbiting and surface assets in the same way for us to get ready for the for Mars. You know, right now on space station, we've got our new, we have new designs for closed loop, even more reliable closed loop systems, up to a 99% recovery on on uh, water and these closed loop systems, very, very, and, and at a higher level of reliability, that's gonna be essential. That logistics problem you have with having people there and how you solve the logistics problems is, is very, very important. Um, we know we've got to figure out how to build materials, how to use materials, what are the right things um, for the uses of different types of materials and, and space. We've had to learn how to both physiologically and psychologically um, keep people safe. And, and through long duration missions and other missions, we've learned things in that, on that LEO platform. That will be even more important for us to learn from around, around and on the moon for us to be able to apply, for us living sustainably on the moon and being able to make those next steps to Mars. Suits. We right now are in the, in the major part of how do you keep people safe as they're, you know, we every day have this great body that when we're on Earth, you know, it, we just we don't realize the freedom we have and we've got to learn how to be able to operate. It's going to be a key aspect of us being able to live in other places, having a, a garment that can protect us as we're out and about. And then maintaining and, and, main, and keeping the crew healthy over time. And how do we do that? And being able to solve that, those logistics challenges is key. Next slide. You know, we don't talk about this, but I always add a slide in all my charts about calm because all these missions, all this can't be done with us being able to get, having communications and data between the mothership here on earth and all the ships out there. And so we right now are really, we're, we're beginning optical missions. We're really starting to kind of push the boundaries with both optical capabilities and, and starting to look at quantum capabilities for us to start really looking at establishing the communication networks for the future. 
And, and obviously for those, anybody that's heard of any of the quantum capabilities, that's really gonna just change the world with how, how we are looking at data and the application of data and collection of data out there. Um, where we have our first instrument flying up this summer on STP3, and uh, we're looking forward to the new age of calm out there. Next slide. So all this happens upon an infrastructure investment that really the nation's been working up to for the last 10 years. And, and we are beginning, like I talked about before, with bots first, boots next. You know, we are really leveraging um, our landing knowledge and capability and working with different companies on our CLIPS missions. Those actually are, are will be beginning next fall and will be starting to kind of lead the way for us to collect our first round of data on the lunar surface. Very, very exciting program. It's just great to be able to work with multiple commercial providers and, and beginning to have multiple platforms where we can collect data and uses over time including leading into what will become more of a structured science application of those of those landings. We've got Artemis 1, our uncrewed demonstration mission for our, our Artemis crew transportation system is coming up we, and uh, we're looking forward to getting the last piece of hardware and getting it through the green run core stage test and then shipped to the Cape for us to shooting for a mission at the end of this year or maybe the beginning of next year, depending on when we get through the green run. But then that sets us up for our crew demonstration mission, Artemis II, closely following that. We've got Gateway right now. We got folks building our next habitation module that will be going around a lunar orbiting platform, along with us working with our international partners to develop the IHAB and the SPREE that will, that will um, flesh out our gateway um, modules. And then we're working on the initial human landing systems. We've got an award for our demonstration mission coming up and we'll be working towards awarding our service contracts in the next few years for our sustainable landers that will be going to the moon by the end of the 20s. And then we're laying in the groundwork for surface mobility. It's actually one of the big areas that we have that we're beginning to talk to our international partners about, but also looking at potential commercial opportunities. You know, it'd be great if one of those CLIPS landers or something else could also be providing additional mobility. We know we've got to land and then we have to have be able to cover areas for us to kind of be able to maximize the use of our, of our missions. Next slide. So um, I think maybe, you know, the key thing here, and we talked about this, we want to go to the moon to stay. And so to be able to stay, there's some missions we can do initially with the human lander where we can have astronauts there for a, a specific duration and the landers itself kind of provide us capability. But we are looking at different habitation modules and different capabilities that we would have that would be on the surface, that would stay on the surface, that would be able to support our crew members, along with having multiple other types of capabilities that to be able to traverse and be able to do science research manufacturing, be able to fully utilize and begin doing some of the research that we need to, to figure out really how to use the capabilities that are there to fuel the next phases of our mission. Next, next slide. So here's kind of all the key things that we're doing, you know, that we're already beginning to lay in the work that we want to do in orbit and on the surface to get ourselves ready. But we're just not one, to be just thinking about this ourselves, we honestly, what makes me so excited about this is that there's other people that wanna do things too. And so we are looking for ways to work with industry, academia, um, uh, you know, our international partners on what activities they also wanna get out of us being around the moon and on the moon and how to use this capability. Next slide. International partners, we, you know, we talk a lot about this, about this is, it takes a team and, and our international partners are a big part of that team. 
it, it's been very exciting to me that that moving this next mission and moving to the moon and seeing how our international partners want to go and, and be part of that journey with us is really opening up opportunities for all of us. It's going to take every ounce of energy we have and having this be a team doing this will provide us with even more capabilities that we all can use. Next slide. So we talk a lot about it, this being a team sport and I think what's, what's, we use that terminology because it's very important to us. It, a team means that we have lots of players, right? We would like to have lots of players. And, and, and we all may have different positions. We all may be doing different things, but we're all working towards a common goal. And so it's very important that, that we are thinking of the end game in mind. And we're trying to figure out how to live and work in space. And so we don't have all the answers. We are need, going to need all of you out there helping us with the answers to solve those big problems. And they are big problems. We don't have them all figured out now. If we did, we'd be there. Um, but, but we need the whole team to be pulling and helping us get to accomplish these large tasks that we have in front of us. Next. And I'm there with you. You know, I think when you're talking about one day, what we want to do is have humans on Mars. We want to go. We want to land. We want to live. We want to explore. I was so jealous of Thomas when he got to see the perseverance, <laughs> you know, and we all got to participate in that. One day I want to see a human landing on Mars and just realize what a great human endeavor that would be for all of us to be engaging in that. Um, I, I, I saw that bot go and one day I'm hoping, if it's not me, it's my children that see a boots on that, on that surface. Next slide. So here I'm ready. I think I'm ready. Any questions? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you so much. I was getting goosebumps, I have to say. I apologize. It's, <laughs> um, I wanted to hear more, but um, it's very exciting. And I think we're going to have an opportunity to really dig in in, in the next part of the, of the program. Um, what what I um, uh, so so thank you again very much. Now let's move into the panel discussion. Uh, Miss Leaders, as we mentioned, will be joining Tom Morata, and I certainly want to encourage folks to ask questions in the comment field. And as as we move along, we'll we'll be uh, looking and and pulling questions out from there. So Tom. <clears throat> Tom is a Beyond Earth Institute co-founder and board chair. He's been with the organization with me, helping to build this from, from day one. Uh, it's going back several years now. He's also an, a, an analyst with the Office of Commercial Space Transportation at the FAA. Earlier in his career, he was a Foreign Service Officer with the U.S. Department of State. Uh, and he is a co-author of an award-winning book, The High Frontier, An Easier Way. So Tom, the program is yours. Thank you, Steve. Thank you to Sierra Nevada. And uh, I'm so glad to be here representing the Beyond Earth Institute uh, and, and moderating this panel. And thank you, Kathy, for that, that outstanding presentation. Um, really exciting. So I'm gonna introduce the other members of our panel. Uh, we're joined today by uh, Dr. Janet Cavandi, who is the Executive Vice President for Space Systems at Sierra Nevada Corporation, and uh, of course, a former NASA astronaut. Thanks for joining us, Jan. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Laura Montgomery. Also supposed to be joined by Matt Ondler, but I understand he's he's running a little late. So um, when he when he joins us, we'll we'll bring him right into the panel. So um, I'd, I'd like to start off the questions. Uh, with you, uh, Dr. Kavandi. Uh, again, thank you for the sponsorship. Um, sure. Yeah, back, so my back pleasure. in November. Oh, my pleasure as well. So well, back Thank in you very much. I appreciate, appreciate your um, allowing us to participate today and share a little bit of our vision. Um, and I have a few charts if you have them, if you want to put those up. 
um, I think it will complement what Kathy was just mentioning. Um, if, if I can go to those, if you have them, I, I can't see them, but let me know. And if they're not, uh, I will uh, ad lib in the middle. <laughs> I'm we'll up here shortly. Um, but okay. I, actually, I, I, have a, I have a question for you while we, sure. while we ad lib, like you said. Um, <laughs> back, back in November, um, the president of SNC, Erin Osmond, she made a very interesting statement. She said, uh, alongside our partners at NASA, Sierra Nevada will build a shining city in space, mm -hmm. which will be a beacon of inspiration for generations to come. Um, of course, that, that language is reminiscent of, of presidential speeches and, and very high-minded, very uplifting. Perhaps you could just take a few minutes to let us know about Sierra Nevada's vision for permanent communities in space and expanding the human, human presence in space. Timing just right. <laughs> you, you stretched it enough for it. Uh, well, I can show you here. Um, let's go to the next slide and maybe it will help explain. Uh, Aaron was right. We are, we're trying to envision a place where people can go and actually live in space and bay. I know that's the vision of many other companies as well and a lot of humanity who would love to have the opportunity to you know, live in space, to see what it would be like to float, to view the earth. Uh, and we want to go beyond low Earth orbit as well, obviously. We want to go and populate the, the surface of the moon. We need to go and learn to live there, to learn how to build and, and make equipment that operates in the radiation, the dusty environment, the no atmosphere, low uh, gravitational fields, and then push all that information to Mars. And Kathy uh, talked about that and summarized that very well. That's also the vision that we share. Um, but, you know, step by step, we hope to get there through these three areas, the transportation. So our transportation system is the Dream Chaser that was mentioned earlier. It, uh, so far, it's the only vehicle, winged vehicle that can come back and land on a runway. Uh, personally, that's the way I would like to come back to Earth. And, and so that's why I chose Sierra Nevada Corporation as the place where, where I chose to contribute after, um, you know, after my time at NASA, my 25 years at NASA. Secondly, we have the destination that you need, you need a place to go with your vehicle. The destination, our first destination would be a low Earth orbit platform. Uh, having helped build the International Space Station, I love the International Space Station. I'm a huge fan. I've been there, worked there, and uh, continue to support the operations on that. However, as we all know, eventually it will come to the end of its natural life. Uh, there's a lot of flexing on the, on the structure and eventually there are cracks and, and just aging over time to the point where we'll have to transition off of the ISS. And at that point, Sierra Nevada Corporation would like to have a platform from which to move a lot of the work from the ISS into a commercial laboratory, a uh, commercial platform uh, with multiple uh, modules like like we have on the ISS, only ours would be inflatable. Um, so we have a plan to put together several to get uh, that would be in the second image there uh, and and get to that location. And then thirdly, it's the infrastructure that you need. Uh, we have propulsion system technology. We, uh, on the right side, there's a plant growth system. You've probably seen astronauts on the International Space Station eating vegetables, lettuce, growing flowers. Uh, we know we'll have to make our own food in these destinations and in, um, in places like low Earth orbit. You can't run to the grocery store, obviously, so you have to grow your own food. Uh, so we're, we're learning how to do all those things. If you go to the next slide, I'll kind of break it down a bit. Um, so here is a vision for a low Earth orbit platform with multiple uh, inflatable uh, modules. And it could be serviced by multiple Dream Chaser vehicles, some of which would be for cargo only. We currently have a contract with NASA to supply cargo to the International Space Station, but ultimately we would also convert part, part of our Dream Chasers to a crewed version so that we could carry up to six people at a time or a combination of fewer people and um, cargo and take passengers and cargo and service this low Earth orbit platform. We also make those solar rays that you see in the back there. We just recently received a, um, an intellectual property a patent for these, this new solar cell design. And so we're planning to build our own um, you know, panels for this space station uh, and then our own nodes. So really the only thing we're lacking right now is the rocket to get us up there when this is all configured. 
And then the next page, please. Um, you know, if, if you were a shuttle hugger, as I was, and loved the space shuttle, I had the great fortune of landing three times on a runway. I know how um, how nice it was to just be, you know, come off the vehicle and, and walk off, get your payloads, payloads off and do your work. Uh, so this, to me, is a, a very logical way to return cargo and, and humans back to the planet. We could land on any runway in the world with about a 10,000 foot capability anywhere where say a 737 could land a day, this, this vehicle could land. So speaking to Kathy's um, desire to include international partners, we're very much in line with that as well. Being able to um, take hardware people uh, from countries who maybe normally don't have the opportunity and even land in their home country as well. Next slide. And there is the vehicle as it sits today. This is uh, called Tenacity. This is our first Dream Chaser vehicle. We're a little bit further along than this shows, but we're currently applying the thermal tiles, which you see in the upper right corner. The wings are about to go on, and we're currently scheduled to launch at that uh, second half of 2022. Next slide. And we have a mission control center down there that you can see. This is the cargo, uh, the, the way the cargo is packed into the uh, vehicle right now. So this one will not carry humans, but we have cargo in the front half of the module. And then in the aft end, uh, where you see that uh, sort of cone shape, that is the vehicle that will bring back the hardware and the, the trash that they don't need on the ISS anymore. That will burn up in the atmosphere. That's called the cargo module or shooting star, is it its name? Because that's what it will look like when it re-enters. And then the, the top, Front part will come back and land on the runway. Next slide. And this shows the inflatable habitat I mentioned that would comprise the, um, the lower Earth orbit platform. So we have a demonstration module that we've already tested uh, for um, maximum inflation. We have uh, passed all those tests very successfully. We had micro meteorite debris impact tests on it. All that pa passed the test very well. And on the right side, you'll see it's about a 27 foot diameter um, device that will be about three levels, three stories tall uh, and equivalent uh, width. And we can have living quarters, plant growth area, exercise, uh, laboratory space, manufacturing space, film studios, whatever people would like to use it for. Um, this could be a capability that pretty much anyone could contract either lease or buy um, access to some of these modules uh, with uh, access by Dream Chaser. And we'll also be able to accommodate other visiting vehicles, so it's not just serviceable by the Dream Chaser alone. Next, next slide. And this is uh, part of that plant growth system that we showed. This on the right side is at the International Space Station. Uh, so this is some of our first uh, plant growth, veggie uh, plant growth system, and you know the astronauts are actually consuming some of that. So. Um, I think that's my last slide. Uh, so that just shows a little bit of our vision for that future in space at Shining City, that destination that we hope to build and service with our dream chasers. And then ultimately we'd like to take those types of uh, inflatables and actually put those on the surface of the moon. Uh, we're one of the contenders for the human landing system that Kathy also mentioned. Uh, and, and we could also provide habitat, uh, surface power, all the life support systems, plant growth systems and all that. So. Very much looking forward to um, to both civil, commercial uh, future for SNC and the rest of the world. Wow, that's outstanding! Um, I love the name of that first vehicle, Tenacity. Great choice of a name. Uh, outstanding. Very Thank near you. and dear to the owner's heart, Aaron Afadi Osmond. Um, felt it took a lot of tenacity to get to this point, <laughs> so they felt it was a very appropriate name for the vehicle. Mm. Yes. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Janet, for that. Um, and uh, I think a lot of people, as Steve said, are familiar with the Dream Chaser, but may not have been familiar with the expandable habitat, the LIFE habitat, another excellent acronym. Uh, what What is that acronym? Can I put you on the spot? Is it? Oh, my gosh. You put me on the spot. Uh, well, I you can come back to that. Yeah, sorry about that. We're, we're I know. Come back to that. It's, a cool, it's a cool acronym. It is, yeah. yeah okay. is, sorry is about fantastic that. fantastic as well. Um, I'd like to uh, bring uh, Kathy and Laura into the into the conversation here. And and Kathy, I'd like to uh, direct the first question to you, if you don't mind. And and I have to ask. I warned you this was coming up um, last week. We were told the human landing system down select is is down to the wire. I think was the phrase. 
Uh, we heard any any updates you can share, any dates you can share uh, on on the down select decision. So you know the team. I think when I when we were talking about it last week in the schedule, the team still feverishly working um, and getting all the packages together for the selection. Um, I think sometimes people don't realize all the steps you've got to go through when you're making final selections and um, and this is a procurement. So it's uh, the, you know, our due diligence is coming into play and we know it's a very important selection for, you know, us investing in a, in a demonstration of a human lander. Um, and uh, so I'm thinking by the end of March, we should be, you know, in, in a good place, um, or at least uh, getting ready to make an announcement, just like we talked about. But um, we're doing yeah. it one step at a time. So I know it's like that everybody's kind of on pins and needles and waiting, which is, is kind of it's kind of fun because it, everybody knows this is a big deal, right? Um, but uh, uh, I, I do think it's very exciting. It's been very exciting. Um, the team's really. I uh, enjoyed working with the multiple companies, and so we're 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 looking forward to this. I, I do want everybody to keep in mind, though, that um, this is our for our demonstration. But but people need to not realize that that that's like the winner, right? People need to know that that we're getting ready to um, looking at building and um, starting our our kind of our process for actually going out with an RFP for our services contracts for this for the sustaining landers at the end of the 2020. So um, this is one award, but we're getting ready to honestly getting ready to in the next you know few years to have our our what will be our sustaining um, lander out there for that will be kind of carrying forward and and um, We'll be delivering crews. I'd love for there to be, even if we do an award, for there to continue to be multiple folks working on landers. But you know, it's part of us, all of us building that economy, just yeah. like what Janet and, and creating this economy where we can maybe potentially have multiples and options for being able to add new ones, just like we added the Sierra folks. You know, later in the game. We'd love to have options maybe to add other landers in the 2030s, right? That'd be really, really cool. So um, I'm hoping we have a whole bunch of landers out there. And at some stage, you know, we can do kind of what we're doing with cargo now and be able to have multiple providers. But we're going to do it one step at a time. That's great. For uh, longtime watchers of NASA and the space pro program, NASA's embrace of uh, commercial procurements, public-private partnerships, whatever you want to call them, it's really um, it's really wonderful. It's really fantastic to see you know the transition from COTS to commercial crew to CLIPS and now to a uh, you know human landing system doesn't have the C in there, but you know we know it's a commercial procurement, so it's it's very very exciting. Uh, we'll be looking out for that. I understand uh, Matt Ondler from Axiom Space has arrived. Um, is he here? Matt, thanks for joining. Yeah, thank you. And sorry I'm late. No worries. So uh, Matt Ondler is the chief technology officer for Axiom Space, and uh, they are building a commercial space station. So great. We're all here. Um, I would like to ask the question I really meant to ask you, Kathy. Uh, <laughs> we got a little sidetracked on the human landing system. Um, the Biden administration understands that space can help improve life on Earth. Uh, hence their emphasis on more earth science to help us better understand the changing climate. How do you see human spaceflight improving life on earth and, and building a better future for all of us down here? For example, um, could ISS astronauts perform research to accelerate in space construction or could Artemis moonwalkers help develop extraterrestrial resources? How do you see human spaceflight both laying the groundwork for communities beyond Earth and, and helping us, quote unquote, build back better today. So, you know, one of my favorite things is that as we solve big problems, we also solve big problems on Earth, right? When you have logistics challenges and you have to develop new technology to be able to solve those logistics challenges, guess what? Those are solutions that can be applied on Earth. So closed loop e ecosystems, guess what? 
we need closed loop ecosystems in lots of parts of the world nowadays. And honestly, the water purification systems, water sources, everything else. And as we're dealing with the changing climate, having those technological benefits that we've had to develop to be able to live in space are what may be allowing us to have solutions here on earth and are already being applied as solutions here on earth. Um, you know, we're gonna have to figure out how to live better on the earth and when you live in space, as Janet knows, you are living very carefully. You don't have a whole closet full of clothes. And you, you don't, there's a lot of things you have to figure out how to do that are very important to be able to live in space. And we'll have to figure out how to live smarter. You have to live very smart in space. And I think those then help us live smarter on Earth. I mean, if you find out in the way our materials are on Earth and the way our clothes is done and everything else, even in little tricks that we found on Earth, if you go back and follow that, follow that trail to where that technology came from, a lot of it, it came because we were having to learn and live on space. I'll, I'll finish up with, because I could probably go on for hours, So you, and you don't want me to, I know, Tom. Um, but one of my favorite ones, honestly, was when COVID hit, we people had to figure out hey, how do I deal with living in an isolated environment? And you know what one of our, our health and human performance folks actually did a bunch of webinars because guess what was the best analog for that? Living and working in space. And so they had to tell people about, hey, you might wanna talk to your friends. Hey, emails, like stay connected, have pictures of your family, do what are, these are all the things that we've learned as we keep crew members, healthy and happy on orbit that guess what helped people live in this new environment here on earth. So I think everything we do in space, the big problems that we're solving in space are caused by us having to deal with that big problem. But when you look at the problem, they're human problems. Mm -hmm. And so through solving that human problem, you can then go say, how does that then help me back on my home planet? These are all just different planets and we're living on a home planet. So how does that then help us? Yeah, great, great. Um, I think that's a great segue to bring to bring Matt into the conversation. Um, so Matt, you guys at Axiom uh, are building a, a commercial space station and you're their uh, director of engineering. Commercial space stations are arguably the first step on the path to full-fledged communities beyond Earth. So with that in mind, what hardware gaps are you seeing for the Axiom station? And more importantly, where would you like to see NASA do more research to better enable the commercial space station industry, if we can call it that, similar to how NASA performs aeronautical research to help the aviation industry? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And, you know, we're, we're getting great support from, from NASA. As, as you know, last year we were uh, announced as the winner of the Port Award, the opportunity to build our space station off the front of the ISS. And it's a great opportunity. It's, it's like uh, being able to go camping and you got running water and electricity, right? You, you don't have to have everything figured out at once. But really, more importantly, we're leveraging the 20 years of uh, ISS and all the lessons learned and all the uh, things that have been discovered in, in the process of keeping humans in space for 20 years. And so there's not a lot of what I would call science gaps. There's a lot of engineering to do. You know, we have a lot of wood to chop to build our space station, but there's not really um, technological gaps. We, we know how to build the space station. We can leverage off of uh, lessons from ISS. And we're also looking outside of the typical aerospace uh, industry uh, for solutions that make sense. For example, our avionics system, our flight computers are based off of uh, automotive industry. You know, most people don't realize a, a modern automobile has 60 to 80 million lines of software code running and multiple processors and lots of sensors that are being analyzed and fused together. So we're taking advantage of those lessons as well. Specifically, your question though, there, there are some things that um, it would be helpful to, to have NASA do, and, and, and NASA's in the process. For example, all of the modules are, are put together through a thing called a common birthing mechanism. 
and uh, there's a passive side and an active side. Well, the International Space Station has the active sides because when a vehicle comes to visit in, in its birth, it just needs to have the passive side. So there's a, a market for building the passive CPMs and NASA has produced a, a build to print package for those. Hmm. Uh, but we need to build active uh, side of the common birthing mechanism and that build package doesn't exist. And so recently the ISS program has asked Boeing to produce that. Um, but that's an example of something that's going to take a while and we're going to have to do some figuring out uh, along our way. But those sort of things, uh, you know, we've alerted NASA to and, and they're helping with. You know, another example is NASA has developed a particular kind of CO2 scrubber that is also in the process of uh, being put into a build to print package for us. and. Uh, and there's advantages for NASA to do that. You know, they'll have someone like us that can build it uh, and then potentially provide it for them for um, uh, use uh, on Gateway or, or other programs. It's great. It's great to uh, hear that you guys are getting into the weeds. And I'm, I'm sure Sierra Nevada is getting into the weeds like that, trying to fix those, those uh, clear engineering questions. Uh, fascinating. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, speaking of getting into the weeds, I'd like to uh, now transition maybe to another aspect of infrastructure people haven't thought of. Um, when we think of infrastructure, we think of physical assets, hardware, but Beyond Earth Institute is a policy think tank. And we also like to think about the legal and regulatory infrastructure. So my next question is, is for you, Laura. Um, it, it's about informed consent, kind of a unique phrase. Currently people go into space on commercial launch vehicles go there under an informed consent legal regime. So can you take a few moments and, and educate us a bit on what informed consent is and share with us how you think it may need to change, if at all, to allow people to live permanently in space? Sure, Tom. Um, thank you for having me here. And yes, informed consent is a notion that was borrowed from the medical community when space tourism really got on the radar, on Congress's radar. And the thinking at the time was that the technology is very new, uncertain, untested, but people still want to go. People still want to have an opportunity to go to space. So it was sort of the um, hand in glove with a marriage of the two. I, I want to be an, an adventure traveler, but um, maybe I don't know what I'm getting into. So you, a launch operator has to tell a spaceflight participant, not a passenger, that, that carries too many connotations of perfect safety, or at least good safety. Um, you need to let the spaceflight participant know that the US government has not certified the vehicle as safe, that the journey may hurt, injure, or kill you, and that the um, you have an opportunity to ask questions and the safety record of the vehicle itself and other vehicles like it. So there's this whole list of scary things that a launch operator or reentry operator has to tell the person getting on board, unless they're a government astronaut. But um, the, uh, so it is, this adventure travel notion was sort of grounded in the thought that we let people climb mountains, and that's really dangerous. We let people parachute out of perfectly good airplanes, and we do you know, let them ride motorcycles in 22 states without helmets. So if you want to do this, you can. You can pay money for it, but they just want to make sure you know how dangerous it is. One thing that I always want to make sure people understand is informed consent is not a waiver of the right to sue. And that was added into the law back in 2015. That, and it's only going to last for 10 years unless it gets extended, and many things do get extended. But the, a spaceflight participant currently has to enter into what we call a reciprocal waiver of claims with the um, launch operator where they agree not to sue each other for bodily injury or death or damage to their property. So those are two separate things. One is going to last longer than the other. Um, the real question is, is whether you need it to go 
further than the FAA's jurisdiction. So right now, for launch and reentry, you need to be given informed consent, but not for going to the moon. So if that was to be required, you'd need a new law from Congress, you'd need the policy debate, and you'd need to figure out whether this is an extra regulatory burden to add on or not. Um, personally, I'd say let's wait. I think the, um, the the FAA portion of it might prove adequate to to scare those who should be scared off. <laughs> and um, uh, but but you know it may turn out not to be down the road. I'm one of those people who thinks we should wait and see before we start adding on regulatory burdens. See if they need to be added on. So I'm in the camp of good enough for now. Let's let's see how it unfolds. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's, uh, I think the, uh, as I said, the regulatory infrastructure is sometimes just as important as, as the physical infrastructure and sometimes even more complicated than the physical infrastructure, uh, as, as we see. So, um, great. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to take a step back now and, and hand the program over to you guys and give you guys an opportunity, uh, to ask each other questions if, if you have any, and uh, I'm going to actually hand the baton over to Dr. Cavandi as, as our sponsor. You get the right of first refusal. So, Janet, do you have any other questions for our, for our panelists? Well, first I want to, you know, clear up the LIFE acronym. It's the Large Inflate, Inflatable Fabric Environment. So too much of a mouthful to, to say, spell that like that. So anyway, LIFE is a lot easier to say. Um, bring life to space, bring space to life. I, I like that. That saying, um, Kathy, I, I guess part of what Matt and I might be interested in is right now um, we talked about the ISS earlier. What time frame would you like to see uh, a commercial uh, platform, a free flyer, for instance, or you know uh, someone who's not necessarily a free flyer, um, be ready to take over some of the work from the ISS? So you know we. Um we would really like to, in the latter part of the 20s, be working towards handing something over. I mean, we talk about, we know the station, you're exactly right. We, even though we, we hate to think about station ending, and I hate to think about it station ending, but um, we have, we know we have to prepare for it. And it's been one of the things why we've been, you know, working to get congressional support of kind of this vision of Com Leo, right? And us beginning to, start um, doing some investments in a Comleo and, and planning for eventually having a commercial free flyer that then we can be, a, we can use right in the future because um, people tend to forget that they think, oh, well, when we start going to, to the moon, we don't have any need for low earth orbit, but that's absolutely not true. We have a we have a sustained need and we actually have a defined need and and we have a team of folks that are kind of trying to, we're going through and beginning kind of the first steps to start defining and anchoring kind of that need. And so stay tuned because over the next, you know, six months we're, we're planning to become more and more public about that, right? And start laying that out. Um, but first, we really need that congressional support of this activity, right? Um, to do that, we would like to start beginning and beginning to have some, you know, collaborative agreements with folks, start working towards that so that at some stage, and, and we'll, we'll con continue to follow along and watch the evolution of the environment. You know, Tom said, thank you for doing this. But honestly, what I say is thank you for you doing it. <laughs> thank you for industry doing it. Thanks for, for people wanting to do this. Cause I think um, this is a tough industry. And the fact that people are out there wanting to serve this need to me is just fantastic. And so, you know, we, we've got to see the evolution of it. Obviously we're going to continue to keep station going as long as we can because and and it's why we've been pushing for extension but you know we would really like to have you know free flyers or at least one free flyer up and operating by the end of the 20s for us to be able to have a smooth transition of our science needs and exploration needs along with you know we're hoping to keep our some level of international partnership agreements um, and continue to use the low earth platform, you know, 
forever. We will always have science at some level. It's just so much easier to try out a technology or go through a protocol or work through something in low Earth than it is until we get like a sustainable platform on the lunar surface, right? Our, our, our near term and near term to me is like multi, multi year, you know, missions will be relatively short term, you know, months missions and um, around the lunar, um, on the lunar, on our gateway platform and then on the lunar surface, probably days on the lunar surface until we get really long term habitats. So having that that extended, continuing to have that extended mission in a low earth platform is going to be very, very valuable for us to continue to flesh out our hardware and our and our physiological protocols that will be important for us to kind of test out prior to even thinking about a, a mission to Mars. Well, that, that begs the question, uh, Kathy, and, and I, uh, well, actually I asked, I, I addressed this to Janet and to Matt. Um, if NASA is looking for a free flyer by the end of this decade, uh, maybe, you know, uh, Janet, maybe you go first. What's the timeline for for your free flyer? And I know, uh, Matt, you guys are, are first intended to be attached, but then when do you expect to potentially detach? So we'll start with uh, Janet. Okay. Yeah, uh, we're we're trying to plan for around the 2026 timeframe for our first launch. Uh, as as I mentioned earlier, and you saw in the, in the presentation, we already have a, a prototype that we've already done the pressure testing and the and the some of the uh, micrometeorite testing. So a lot of that is behind us. We're already working on the infrastructure internally and the life support system. So I think uh, 2026 is, is sort of a time frame we're going to try to shoot for um, and have something that we can really have some time on orbit, demonstrate the, the capability, demonstrate that we can dock to it safely, transfer back and forth by... Great. Um, and, and Matt, can you tell us a little bit about uh, Axiom's timeline? Yeah, so our first module launch is uh, September of 2024. And uh, we have uh, actually some of the first forgings that are in the plant uh, at our partner, Talisalania, that are being uh, uh, machined right now to build the primary structure. And then uh, subsequent launches are six to nine months apart. And then uh, we'll be ready to uh, detach from the station late 27, early 28. Um, and so uh, all those things are progressing nicely. Great. So the end of the decade is going to be very, uh, very busy in space for, for private space stations. Um, we have a question from the audience, a pretty good question from uh, Michael Mealing, and it's a question for Janet. Is Sierra Nevada planning on building and operating its own station, uh, so or be a systems and hardware provider to someone else who will operate the station? So right now the plan is to operate the station ourselves, but that doesn't mean eventually that you know if this works out well and uh, a lot of commercial interest is there, and we might offer uh, a different, entirely different platform for. Uh, a manufacturing facility that might be operated uh, by that by another company. Uh, but initially, our plan would be to operate the first one ourselves and maintain it ourselves and resupply it ourselves. And then eventually over time, which I believe is very probable, is that we're going to have a lot of interest from many countries and many entities who see a future in space that might want to, you know, take acquisition of an entire platform with maybe three to four inflatable modules and acquire services to support that. Maybe we could still fly the Dream Chaser back and forth and do the resupply and carry people back and forth. But maybe the station would be operated by a separate entity and would transfer ownership to them. Um, I would say anything is on the table still. We wouldn't take anything off the table at this point in time. Uh, it's even conceivable that different countries might want to have their own platforms or, or different um, agencies might want to have their own platforms that we could help uh, either partner with internationally and have multiple countries together or maybe maybe independent ones. 
Uh, and then there's also the possibility of using a platform or transportation system for DOD or NSS purposes as well. So lots of different opportunities for any any of these vehicles up there. Well, sign me up for the uh, FAA space station in uh, mid 2030s. I'm I'm there. <laughs> yeah. um, great, great. I I'd like to uh, kind of take us down a different path a little and. Uh, you know, Kathy mentioned international partnerships and the Beyond Earth Institute is very much in favor of international partnerships. You know, we're based here in America, but, uh, you know, space is all of humanity going at, going out there, not, not just Americans. So, um, Laura, I know you have some experience uh, with the Artemis Accords and, and, and being involved with uh, international partnerships. Um, Russia recently announced it will sign a memorandum of understanding with China to expand cooperation on lunar exploration and eventually the establishment of a lunar base. Currently, neither Russia nor China uh, are signatories to the Artemis Accords. At least they weren't this morning. I don't know if anything's changed today. Um, not having Russia and China in the Artemis Accords, is this a problem for future lunar exploration? Um, and besides the Artemis Accords, what other tools do you see to help persuade Russia and China to um, to abide by kind of these, this growing international consensus uh, signified by the Artemis Accords? Well, um, one thing to keep in mind about the Artemis Accords is that they are, the bulk of them are restating and building on principles in the different outer space treaties. So they are an outgrowth of and to the extent that um, they show one means of complying with the outer space treaties, it would probably pr be perfectly fine if Russia and China did something else, so long as they were also complying with the outer space treaties, which is a good thing to do. And um, I think that there are a few places where we see the accords go even further than the treaties in terms of um, good policy goals, and some of them are sort of benign, you know, interoperability between the various different space agencies in the world who plan to work together. That's just a very sensible thing to, to agree to. Um, the Outer Space Treaty, one of the provisions in the Outer Space Treaty, for example, has a requirement that before you or your citizens engage in harmful interference with someone else in outer space, you should consult with each other. Well, the Accords go a little further and say, oh, let's have some safety zones so that we know when we're at risk of interfering with each other. So um, that's that might be something that the Russians and Chinese put in their MOU. They might only agree to that with each other. They, the the treaties still require them to consult if they think they they see a potential for harmful interference so i think you know between them the we, we shouldn't be too concerned uh there's there's more things in the accords that are in the treaties but but those are all things that i know china has said that it is going to try to avoid space to creating space debris too so um hopefully they'll they'll keep planning to avoid that and uh, that's something that's in the accords, but not in the treaties. So um, as for other tools, well, the biggest one is the treaties themselves. And, you know, you, Russia and China are signatories to the Outer Space Treaty and uh, have therefore agreed to abide by it. So that's, that's a big tool right there. And as for other things, well, you know, we have been doing partnerships with the Russians. We're not allowed to do partnerships with the Chinese to some extent. So, you know, I'm not sure what other tools are left, but I think the outer space treaties themselves are, are a good tool. Uh, thank you, I was, I was muted, sorry about that. Um, Kathy, so the next question is for you. Um, before getting your engineering degree, uh, you studied finance. And in your career at NASA, uh, you worked closely with uh, other commercial companies through commercial crew and cargo. So you have you have uh, some you know both expertise in engineering and in, and in business. Um, in your opinion, what commercial businesses would you like to see form today 
to advance the space economy and facilitate communities beyond Earth. Are there any particular sectors or product lines that need more or less investment to achieve both NASA's exploration goals and kind of this broader goal of, of communities beyond Earth? Well, I actually think when um, when we limit it, we screw up. Okay, so so I actually think it kind of goes back to the discussion we had before, which is to talk about what are the basic problems you have here on Earth, and just with way you're, and then just kind of look at it like we tend to treat space like it's special, right? Mm -hmm. Which it is special, right? But 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 I really feel like, and it's and it's one of those things where when we kind of push ourselves and put ourselves in a different environment and then force yourself to kind of solve that problem, your basic problems, you're getting a different viewpoint and that new, different viewpoints what provides the opportunity. Business opportunities, investment opportunities, you are creating opportunities. So so I actually think it's, it's we should be looking at the things we're not normally looking at to go figure out what's the best way. I actually think, you know, when I came in to NASA, we kind of have like, had like a cookie cutter way of going and building hardware and doing our projects and our programs and everything else. And I think what's been the most valuable about the last 20 years that I've been in NASA is we kind of ripped off the bandaid in a lot of ways and opened up new ways to do it. Because what we found out is that it's by kind of making everybody a space person that you get the access, the best access to the best solutions for your ideas possible. You know, we right now are trying to figure out how to partner with everybody, how to partner with food companies for food and space, how to like, how to go look at, go looking at people that are dealing with, um, how do you deliver food to a, a refugee camp somewhere and keep that food interesting, you know? I mean, when you're going to, so, so, looking at other people that are kind of solving the problems that you need to solve and that may not be space people, but they are space people. Everybody on this earth is a space person. <laughs> They're figuring out how on this planet to live, right? And we yeah. just got to get that mentality that if we're going to the moon or Mars, how do we co-opt everybody's brain here and make them space people about just changing to that new environment? So, yeah. um, I really would like to make everybody a space person and help us and think about, hey, I can do something to solve your problem. Because if I get that, then I'm co-opting the best and the brightest in the world to be able to solve our problems. So every company is a space company. They just every company is a space company and they just don't know it yet. You got to get your helmet on. I got to get each of them a little like their little sign in their office. I don't care. You are Kellogg's. You're a space company. Ford, you're a space company. Mitsubishi, we know you're a space company. You know, I mean, we're all space companies. You know, that's so great. we, we got to do it. We got to do it. That's great. That's that's. I think that might be the quote of the uh, of the whole webinar. Uh, every person is a space person. Every company is a space company. Um, we're getting we're getting down. Oh, go ahead. Matt. Yeah, if I might add, you know, I think uh, related to that is that at Axiom we're trying to build this this infrastructure that allows all kinds of companies to come and, and, and manufacture something. And, you know, it's, it's, it's analogous to the, to the iPhone where it's impossible to have imagined all the applications that are on an iPhone now. Right. And so that infrastructure of the iPhone enabled all these people to come in with ideas and applications uh, to, to use it. And similarly, we want to build an infrastructure that uh, is easy to, uh, plug hardware into if you're running something in the lab at Johnson Johnson we want to make it really easy to plug it into our station as well and, and utilize the microgravity environment and so by building that infrastructure we're going to enable companies that we can't even imagine uh, uh, have an application that benefits from that environment that's outstanding yeah that's great so kind of a plug and play perhaps right I, right yeah that's great so we're, we're coming down to the wire here, and, and I know a lot of people are getting distracted by uh, the test launch that's happening right now. Um, but I have to ask one more question of, of, of each of you, and it's something we ask all of our panelists. 
And, uh, you know, we, we have a definition uh, for communities beyond Earth here, Beyond Earth Institute, and it's a community beyond Earth is defined as a group of people building, sustaining, and growing an economically vibrant, self-governing society outside of Earth. So with that definition in mind, when do you guys think the first community beyond Earth will be built? Um, and so Matt, since you're you're right here already, why don't you go first, and, and then uh, we'll uh, we'll go down the line. Well, with that definition, because uh, usually when I think of community, I think of uh, kids and uh, little league and stuff like that. So that's probably sure. a bit away. But uh, under your definition, I, I really think once we become a free flyer, we fall a lot in that category, right? Where we'll have people that are going to our station to do work. You know, they might, we might have built a custom module for DuPont and there's a DuPont engineer on rotation that comes there and, and does their work. So I think by the end of this decade, we will have uh, a, a lot of that that definition, uh, uh, you know, achieved. So when do you think the first baby will be born? Since you mentioned kids in Little League, when do you think the first baby will be born in space? Uh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's dangerous. Yeah, I that's think, uh, dangerous. That's, you, know, <laughs> you can defer. You can defer. It's all right. It's a whole, whole other avenue. <laughs> Kathy, when do you think the first community beyond Earth? Uh, you know what I found out is um, I don't think we should be asking that question because they'll limit us. Uh -huh. So, so I think uh, I think we need a. Um, we need to just make it as fast as we can get there, right? Because the, what I found out is, um, and I love Matt's answer because it's his definition of community. And I love it that you're probably thinking of like something on the moon and probably somebody else is thinking about something on Mars. And, you know, and uh, so I, I think it'd be really cool. I actually think it'd be really cool in the 2030s if we could get people living to an extent on the moon, right? First yeah. there on the moon going but i actually think it's really really cool and i love that we actually could be having communities in lots of places <laughs> so in low earth orbit and on the moon and and then getting ready to to me the thinking about mars and laying in the groundwork for mars but um it all begins right with the with where we are today that's what's so cool we're, we're on the journey for first yeah. step, right? So Mike, Mike Gold, um, we had Mike Gold from NASA, and he said the same thing as soon as possible. So yeah, yeah, you, guys, you can. You guys are in. Hey, what I've learned is when you talk to people that are gonna go fly or go climb Mount Everest, you don't ask them how many steps they're gonna take. Right, right. Because yeah, because that's not ever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not a good place to be. So we we we're gonna get to the top, but but. Um, Let's not limit ourselves. Yeah. Laura, last time you were on a Beyond Earth, uh, last time I asked you that question, you said 50 years. Are, are you sticking by the 50 year number? Well, I that was one of those uninformed um, answers that was a balance of pessimism and optimism. Now I'm gonna say the 2030s. <laughs> I like <laughs> you it. You no, know, copying Kathy's answer here. That sounded right. good to me. And she knows more than I do, so. Oh, <laughs> very good. And uh, Dr. Cavandi, Sierra Nevada, thanks again for your sponsorship. You get you get the last word before I hand it back to Steve. Oh. Are you are you keeping track? Are you keeping track? Sorry, Janet. I want to know. Are you guys keeping track? We need to start like having bets or something. On this we year. we absolutely <laughs> are keeping track. We have yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, Janet. Well, then I'm going to cheat and say, but I think we've already had our first communities in space. We've had them up there for a long period of time. ISS is a community in space right now. Even Skylab was a community in space many years ago. So I think we've checked the low Earth orbit. <clears throat> you know, we've already been there, done that. And what Kathy is saying is, is right, right? We need to go to the next level, which is, you know, a little bit further into our solar system, which is the, the moon. That's what I'd always, if I could have picked anything, I would have loved to done a lunar habitat and lived on the moon for a while. But I think that's the next big goal is to learn to live on another heavenly body. Uh, it's not really a planet, but it's like a planet. It's got no atmosphere. It's got a lot of dust. It's got no protection from radiation. It's got lower gravity. <clears throat> so how do we make things work there? And and when they break, then they will. 
we'll learn how to redesign it, maybe remanufacture it on the surface there and not have to bring parts back from Earth because we know how to 3D print things by that point in time. We'll know how to do telemedicine well enough by that point in time. We may not have to bring people back home. We need to learn to live completely independently of the Earth. And I think I'm, I'm agreeing. I think we'll be in the early 30s where we'll actually be able to uh, live independently of Earth. There will be exceptions. We will have incidents and, and accidents and things that will break that we didn't anticipate. But that's that's good because we're close to home still. And when we get all that worked out, we push this next vehicle to Mars and we learn how to live uh, on that planet, which is much further away. And uh, and we'll have to be pretty good to make that one work. And so all these baby steps uh, do, do get us to that point in time where we're very successful in interplanetary species at that point in time. Excellent. Well, thank you all for your time. Steve, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm usually, uh, I'm usually inspired by all of you, um, and uh, I think uh, I think Kathy has the quote of the day: "Everyone on Earth is a space person." So, and I think you mentioned about you're going to be sending out helmets or something like that. I look, I'm going to wait for mine. I'll look for mine. <laughs> but uh, you know, <laughs> I you know we you know so much of what we're doing here. We ask this question at the end, and it really sometimes it stretches people. Sometimes people don't expect or know about it, but you know, it's just a matter of are we thinking of this question? Uh, because really, this is the path that we're on, right? As I said at the very beginning, that we are trying to create. It's it, it's about the technology. It's about the interesting science and, and, and exploration that we're doing. But ultimately, it's about a human race that's sort of stretching itself. Um, Janet used the term, you know, becoming multi-planetary, a multi-planetary species. And that will come. Will it come in 50 years? Will it come in 20 years? You know, and the timing almost doesn't matter. But of course, we are taking scores, so we have a you know, and, and we're gonna uh, we're gonna starting a pool, and then the, the person who gets it dead on, you know, we're actually gonna start taking actual dates. So whether and uh, the person who, uh, who who gets it gets it right will get a big prize. Um, so at any rate, I want to thank you all again. Uh, it's been a fantastic program. I want to I want to thank Tom, especially for doing a wonderful job moderating this. And uh, we, you know, again, if you're, uh, as you, uh, as you, please want to invite you to come to the uh, Beyond Earth website, look at uh, at what we're doing. Uh, it's an opportunity for you to um, get involved, contribute, and be part of this movement that that we're that we are we are part of, and you are part of. So, uh, with that. Uh, I thank you all and we will we will sign off and we'll see you uh, we'll see you next time.